now it is my distinct um, honor and privilege really to introduce our, our featured guest this evening. Uh, the first of whom um, is, is, a, is a dear, dear friend of mine and someone who I look up to tremendously, who has inspired me in my own life, who's been an amazing collaborator with Reimagine uh, and a spiritual guide and teacher for so many of us. Uh, his name is Day Shilkrit, an award-winning queer author, artist, ritualist, teacher, and internationally known for morning altars, which Buzz BuzzFeed calls a celebration of nature and life. Day has worked with thousands of individuals, communities, and organizations to help heal the culture through a meaningful and creative response to marking personal and collective change. He has created morning altars at reimagined festivals in both San Francisco and New York, uh, these beautiful works of art and, and inspiration and creativity that you saw at the beginning and you'll see more throughout the session. Day is the author of a book that I love, Hello, uh, Goodbye, 75 Rituals for Times of Loss, Celebration and Change, which I did not know this, hit Amazon's number one book in three categories. Congratulations, Day, um, for that. Uh, well-deserved, as well as he has published another one of my favorite books, just keeps it coming, Morning Altars, a seven-step practice to nourish your spirit through nature, art, and ritual. Um, so thank you, Dave, for joining us. And you will be joined today by someone I'm just meeting, but I've heard incredible things about and is part of your world uh, as well. So Rabbi Amachai Lau Levi, am I saying that correctly? P perfect. Rabbi, Rabbi Amachai is the founding spiritual leader of Lab Shul. He is, he is an Israeli-born Jewish educator, writer, and performance artist, a member of the Global Justice Fellowship of the American Jewish World Service, and serves on the advisory council of the International School for Peace, a refugee support project. He's also a member of the advisory council for the Institute of Jewish Spirituality. And Rabbi Amachai has been hailed as an, uh, an iconoclastic mystic by Time Out New York, a rock star by the New York Times. And I'll, I'll be curious to learn more about this and how you, you feel about this label, a Judaic Pied Piper, a maverick spiritual leader and one of the most interesting thinkers in the Jewish world by the Jewish week. So as you can tell, there's a Jewish theme to this experience this evening. We, we at Reimagine have, have centered these conversations on disparate and many diverse communities. And today um, we are diving in, in some ways to the world of Judaism, but in all of these unique uh, textures that, that we're gonna be exploring with Day and Rabbi Amachai. So welcome both of you to this conversation. And I just wanna begin today, since this is a vigil, um, if, if you wouldn't mind sharing, if there's any thing, any one, as we let candles today that you would like to bring and honor in this space. Okay. Yeah, I actually, um, a friend of mine died yesterday morning. Um, and uh, she was in her 80s and, um, and a runner until she was 79. And she had long, long braids and was a mother, a grandmother, um, a friend, a teacher, someone who was tracking my life so well and who was faithful to the written letter. And so I would get written letters from her in the mail all of the time. And, um, and so I, I sent her blessings and love as she runs towards her people across the Rainbow Bridge and um, you know, may we continue to remember her in, in a good way and may I continue to make beauty that honors her life. And so I'm sitting with that, that loss right now and honoring her. Thank you. And Amachai. Sorry for your loss. Day, I'm day. so sorry. Thank, Thank you, you for sharing that brother day. Uh, good evening, friends. I'm in a remote hotel in Maine some strange hiking and mystic storytelling retreats so i can't light a candle in this hotel room but i will raise a glass of wine on this night in the jewish tradition is the yorkzeit the anniversary of rubenachman of breslov's death 
and he was a famed mystic and storyteller and a ritualist back in the 18th century and a great storyteller. One of his famous quotes was, let me tell you bedtime stories that will wake you up. So I trust we will do some of that tonight. All memories. So I really, my hope is, is to spark a conversation between the two of you because you have so much wisdom and I want to stay out of the way as much as possible. Although I sometimes can't help myself for, because of your inspiration here, but maybe we can start off uh, kicking off the conversation by hearing, you know, what you think each other each do in the world and, 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 and how it relates to, 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 to the both of you, how you relate to each other. Well, I just want to say um, this is not a first time collaboration. And um, a couple of years ago, I had the privilege of being the artist in residence at Lab Shul um, for their high holidays and um, and had the opportunity to create beauty and art while Amichai and Naomi and your team were creating beauty and meaning on stage. And there was a, a almost a syncopated rhythm that was happening between you and me where the beauty was just moving between us, like back and forth and being made manifest. And, um, and so, you know, it was just a mighty collaboration um, to mark the, the new year, to mark the remembering of those that had passed that year. This was right before the pandemic. Um, so really, you know, in a way marking something mysterious that we didn't know we were entering into. So a mysterious threshold, um, you know, that year was the beginning of the pandemic and, um, and Amichai, you know, the question, it's an interesting question. So, you know, to, to say like, really to have witnessed you in that role of, you know, that Jewish Pied Piper comment is honestly a very, very honest uh, rendering of, of how I also see you. But I'd say more so a, um, a, a weaver of, uh, an inviter in, a bridge builder to um, the intersection of art and meaning and spirit. And, um, and I see you sitting at the crossroads of that. I see myself maybe sitting there too. And, um, and I just, you know, you're such a gift to this world. And, um, and it's, it's truly an honor to keep weaving these moments together so that we can bring more beauty in a time of so much pain. And um, I'm truly honored to be seen by you and with you. And, um, and also just to know you also as a queer brother in this in this march towards healing the healing of our of many different types of our people in the world so Brother Jay, thank you for thank you for the love and for seeing me i'm seeing you we are we are querying our inherited tradition traditions in a lot of ways and this is such a beautiful question uh brad i don't know you yet but i love reimagine and the work that reimagines our sacred space at times of grief and in terms of growth and to work with the end of the years and with the team just being the gift of remembering is working with day is working with naomi is like that we get to create the rituals that we inherited and give meaning to our lives if we take them into our hands. And it's not just a relay race, but you gotta make it our own. Whether it's through music, through art, through liturgy, through translating the past into the present. And that's why I feel we meet and co-create. Um, and today I wanna say you joined us uh, indeed at a very, very auspicious threshold and co-created, created just like these altars in the middle of Hammerstein Ballroom with earth and shells and feathers and leaves and just brought earth into the sacred space and made it sacred in the middle of the urban. And so many people have since like through you and through this work have been 
decentralizing sacred space from temple or church into home, into wherever I am, co-creating, inventing little mandalas. I got an email this morning from a young woman who was with us for Yom Kippur this last year. We were back again in person in downtown New York City, but a lot of people were online and she got COVID the week before and couldn't join us. A beautiful artist who was also one of our artists in residences. But she said, inspired by what they did those few years ago, I built my own little earth altar in front of the screen at my home. So mm. as you were meeting downtown and you were in real time, I was with you building an altar. Mm. And because we're on the middle of the holiday of Sukkot, where mm. Jews do the weird thing of building holy huts in our backyard to celebrate impermanence, we also wave around these weird ancient medicine bundles of the four directions and for species. So I have mine right here. I flew with it from New York, which was sort of weird. And then in my room, inspired by you, I hope you can see it. I built this little altar that has a lot of fall leaves that I picked up today and the holy fruit of the atog, the citrus. Mm. So had it not been for you, I probably would not have built a little pagan altar to the four species in my hotel room. <laughs> uh, so no, it would look good for this. But uh, you've inspired me to embody inspired so many of us to embody the spiritual it's not mm. just our work not just the ideas it's the embodiment of the aesthetic and i think if there's anything we know from being post-patriarchal is that we inherited so much richness but also a disembodied uh to an extent judaism it was afraid of the body it was afraid of the woman's body it was afraid of the queer body it was afraid of the sensual and the yeah. grief is one of the rare places in Jewish practice where the embodied is so allowed to an extent, which will get us to the next conversation, I'm sure. But for you, I'm going to say they bringing the embodied into a ritual space is a huge gift. So many of us. So I, I, I'm curious, um, and I, you know, to have two spiritual leaders, but who do it in different ways day uh real i mean I, and i would let, i'm sure uh Amaha, you're doing it in the same way today by creating an altar uh made out of found objects but i'm wondering how 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 does one become a spiritual leader <laughs> well i mean from my perspective it's not necessarily something that um you know that I'm that I'm actively like pursuing or choosing. I think the leadership comes from, in some ways, standing with my gift. So much so, such a faithfulness to the gifts that I've been given, and a well practiced, sometimes to the to the point of of heartbreak, a well practiced way of giving them away and modeling, in some ways, how to do that. Um, and so whatever kind of leadership is I claim or that's projected upon me is really a devotion to the gift that I'm carrying and that I've been gifted and, and that sense of reciprocity of the gift, the back and forthness of giving the gift and, and, and receiving it. Um, you know, whether that gift is the gift of my art or the gift of making community, you know, I, to me, people refer to my art sometimes as a mandala, um, you know, but I would refer even to community as, as the same kind of thing, which is many into one. You know, all of my art are many, many pieces that are being brought into one whole piece. And the beauty of my art is that part of the gift is the reminder of its impermanence, meaning that it's not meant to last community comes and goes there's that sense of ebb and flow to it it moves it's not stagnant it it breathes and as i was teaching earlier today to a cohort that i teach you know the sense of togethering or we-ness that whatever we claim as a sense of we has to be made time and time again it's something that we can't rely on as something that's you know established we have to keep coming together and the beauty of anything impermanent is that the impermanence teaches us to do it again. So there's an againness that's connected to impermanence, meaning we build it, 
it, it changes and we have to do it again. And that's the beautiful thing about cycles. That's a beautiful thing about calendars. That's a beautiful thing about return, anniversaries. And that's a beautiful thing about ritual is there's an againness in it. In the very word ritual, the etymology of the word itself means to count. But the way that I see ritual is more akin to how a musician counts which is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. There's that sense of needing to return to the rhythm over and over again so that you stay in the music because it's so easy to lose our place in the music, in our lives. So we stay, we, and musicians that play together, they count together so that they stay together in the music. So ritual is both sometimes an individual and more often a collective way for us to remember together to stay in the music together because it's so easy to forget. So it helps us to come back to what's important. Another word that's connected to ritual is return. It helps us to return to the center or to return to what's important. You know, and so, you know, impermanence is the teacher of, and it's the mechanism really to return and to, to really stay in the music, to stay in the music time and time again, one, two, three, four, count and return. Count and return. Handing it to you, Amichai. I'm thinking about what you said about uh, impermanence and return. And, and I'm sorry if I'm freezing up a little bit. Um, hotel Wi-Fi, okay? We love you. We're rolling with it. We're going to thaw you with a candle. Keep going. Great. I hope the candle helps the freeze. Um, <laughs> what you're saying about uh, impermanence as, as art day, I'm thinking about spiritual leadership for your question, Brad. For many years before I became a rabbi, my slogan was artists are the new rabbis. And as my colleague Naomi and others know, art as a spiritual creativity is spiritual leadership. And in a world where organized religion is so struggling to convey what it's supposed to be conveying, mm -hmm. spiritual leadership rises up in so many ways. Once I become a rabbi, I decided to uh, say that sometimes rabbis are the new artists. Um, and I still think that spiritual leadership pops up grassroots in ways that we are feeling. And it's not necessarily somebody who's ordained, only who's a successful artist. And I want to share a brief example with you. Um, last Friday, I had the privilege of um, helping bury a friend, an artist, a, a member of the other kids, a beautiful woman who was a potter and who passed away in her 60s from cancer and was buried in a natural burial upstate. And what she asked was for her burial to be her last work of art and for everybody there to bury her together. And there was one woman, one friend of hers who was there. And as we sang in the beat and prayed and beautiful things, when we began actually covering her body with soil, this woman took charge and became the spiritual leader of this act of community of burying a friend taking turns with the shovels and until the entire pit was covered. And our sister was really completely buried as a communal act. And we said that was art. That was a ritual of letting us through the singing and through the burial. And the spiritual leadership there was co-created. Such a powerful way to, uh, yeah co-create this art and so i'm not sure where you're going with your breath but i want to say that as someone who's a rabbi in a community that is artist driven and everybody friendly and god optional um, working with day working with other artists is a way to really challenge what we think and where we receive and retrieve our spiritual information 
Brad, I want to jump in real quick and just say something, which is, Amichai, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you for conjuring such a, an incredibly um, colorful and, and heartbreaking story. It's just really, truly a gift that you're giving us. Thank you. Um, it's, it, it's, it's waking a memory inside of me of uh, not too long ago of the death of my dog and, um, and a ritual that we did the night that we put her down and um, and in some ways really, you know, had to reinvent, you know, ritual because from my own tradition and culture, from the Jewish culture, you know, we don't really have anything to direct us when it comes to the loss of an animal. And so I had to rely upon, you know, kind of pulling different pieces together, which is really the whole you know, definition of art, uh, the etymology of what an artist is, literally it means to, to put back together again. That, that is the etymology of the word itself. Um, arty is the word, to put back together again. And so what we, were, what we did is I asked each person that came to sit with this dog, my beloved, who knew her so well, um, each come with a plant that we could bundle her with. Um, a plant that they witnessed her enjoying in her life. And so after she, we put her down, she was laying there and I laid her onto a beautiful piece of fabric and we put, you know, there was someone brought fennel and we put fennel on her berry and someone brought chamomile flowers and we put them on her paws and someone brought redwood bark and we put it on her spine and all of the many places that that she would walk in and explore in the places that she loved and we bound her in that place itself and in some way we put her back together again with the place and you know it's like we had to in some ways i had to reinvent a ritual in that moment um, which is reminding me of a quote from michael mead he says rituals are traditionally are made from what's at hand they're partially remembered and partially made up on the spot and in some ways, we were remembering a ritual in that, and we were making it up. And we were, I was pulling from, you know, traditions that have inspired me, and I was also very much pulling from my own craft as an artist and as, a, and as an earth lover. And what, at the end of that ritual, she was, you know, she was just covered in flowers and plants and herbs. And the heartbreak and the tears that were flowing from all of us that evening were also met with such beauty and sweetness of the plants and it was you know a little bit i don't know if the word is easier but it was a little bit more comforting to put her down into the ground that night so thank you amichai for helping me remember my beloved and of course that ritual that that was so beautiful and made up in the moment and and day i mean maybe just briefly since you're in etymology wizard <laughs> maybe you can just tell us the etymology of remember because i i i, I as, as you keep using that word sure it. yeah the i mean when you have not all of the time but in this regard when you have the re in front of the word it means againness which is giving you the clue that you didn't so you have to do it again or you did but you forgot so the re is saying again, and the member is in some ways used to be a verb, but now it's not really a verb to member, but in some ways membership kind of creates that sense of wholeness, belonging to something rounded and whole. And so remember is the need to bring back together again, to bring back the memory again because it got dispersed or it got forgotten. It reminds me of a quote from a beautiful book, Braiding Sweetgrass, um, Robin Wall Commemorer says something along the lines of, our elders tell us that our ceremonies and rituals are the ways that we can remember to remember. And so it's inherent that, and it's inevitable that as humans we forget. So this, you know, the, the need to remember is not inevitable. So we have certain rituals and ceremonies in place that help us to do it again and again and again. You know, and, and I, I'm really struck. So I guess, Amacha, you asked the nature of my question, and, and it started out about, you know, how, how, what makes somebody a spiritual leader and how you both became spiritual leaders. And I look at Day's Instagram, for example, with this beautiful uh, ritual and art and, and people follow 
day, right? And, and I'm sure it's similar, you know, and there's this idea of followership, which we now have in, in the social media paradigm. We follow people. Um, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm talking off the cuff here, but I guess part of what Reimagine believes, and I'm curious about this, is that, you know, inspiration and leadership can come from anywhere, that we can turn to each other and find that within each of us. Um, but then there's something, as you're both talking, about offering um, ritual to others uh, to help uh, ground others. A and, and also Dave talked about leaning into his own gifts. Um, I I'm wondering, you know, in, that, in this vein, uh, before we talk a little bit more about mortality, um, but how each of us in our own lives, how we can be spiritual leaders of one another or maybe we already are but and we don't we just don't always see ourselves that way but i, I just want to offer that for you to reflect on on how we might um lead and follow in ways that support one another um so as you were talking brad i'm thinking um this beautiful line by emily dickinson that says the wounded deer leaps highest. And this notion of the healer, that's each and every one of us, of course, we are centaurs. Um, and that our own grief and our own journeys are the ones that give us, if we pay attention, uh, the opportunity and the tools to cope, to hope, to overcome, to create something that helps us overcome into the next phase of who we are and then perhaps to share it with others as a way to both be helped and then pass on a tool of coping mm. so it is indeed a human capacity and often uh, i will talk about grief if you will it's like sort of on my mind tonight um i found personally that through my own process of grief for loved ones uh, tools were created, rituals were either reclaimed or invented, remembered, they said, um, and then shared with others. And I'll share briefly a few with you, again, from a very personal experience. Uh, my father died almost eight years ago. Um, and uh, I was in Jerusalem while my community was here uh, in New York and elsewhere. And realizing that I will not be saying the mourner's prayer, the Kaddish, with my community in the same room, uh, a way pre uh, zoom popularity we created a phone uh, a phone in kaddish during my shiva back in december eight years ago and um that phone in kaddish where people could hear me say the morning's prayer and others in the community who lost loved ones said amen to each other and they were the first one there were like a couple hundred people and then that became a weekly tradition every thursday at 12 noon eastern we have our phone in Kaddish. It's been going on almost eight years, every year's day. Naomi here has been one of our leaders and holders of that sacred space. We take turns every Thursday. I see Sandy, our friend and community leader, who's also coming to. As community people who've gone through grief became their own moderators of this space for others. So it is um, the gift of growth from grief that keeps on giving. And that's when uh, example, I'll, I'll share um, another one briefly. Um, when I was sitting Shiva for my father, a friend came to me with a ceramic plate. Um, and he's from the Kurdish Jewish community from Kurdistan. And in the Kurdish community, the Shiva plate, usually made of bronze, but sometimes pottery, and has room in it, seven hard boiled eggs. And when the mourner comes back from the cemetery, the first meal the first uh, uh, meal of recovery is offered when the, the mourner gets this tray, the shiva plate with the hard boiled eggs and eats a hard boiled egg because that's a symbol of both mourning and, and, ho and sort of recovery. Probably because it's round and probably because it was cheap. So it's my guess. But the shiva plate is something that is then the mourner keeps for the entire week of shiva and keeps it in their care until someone else in the community needs the shiva plate and then that person cooks seven eggs and goes to their house with the shiva plate so i get the shiva plate in jerusalem eight years ago it went through about 25 homes in our community 
um, including Naomi, when she went to losing her parents in Chicago and it went to LA and it was just in New York and now it's upstate New York. I went to the funeral upstate last Friday with this shiver plate from another friend's home with in our world days. And that moment of like this art piece, this gastro Judaic morning ritual that passes from hand to hand in the community um, becomes another way for people to take agency and offer spiritual healing and just support love to each other in the cyclical, cyclical way. Um, so these are just examples of how from our own wounds, we become the, the spiritual providers for others. And I do think that part of the reimagine work and what we're trying to do and many others is to give us back some of the tools that we forgot we have and help reclaim and reimagine ones. It will help us do exactly that. Hmm. Can I jump in? Please. Matt? Okay. So beautiful, Amichai. Thank you so much for sharing those stories and those beautiful rituals and, um, and continuing to open your heart and remember your father in our presence. Um, and, uh, well, I wanted to share something, but, you know, I said the word father. And so suddenly this, this image just popped up in my head. So I'm going to share it and then I'll share this other thing I was intending, but my father's birthday was a few weeks ago and, um, he's been dead now for 11 years. And, um, and as it seems, I, I tend to make art and, um, and meaning out of nature, which at least that's what I've been doing from, you know, for the last 15 years or something. But, um, my dad's, for some reason, it, every time I make something to honor him, it's, it's always food. And, um, and so I wrote about this recently, but I did a little altar for my father by the creek on his birthday. And instead of using leaves and berries, I used little Debbie treats, um, those Swiss rolls. And I made an altar out of little Debbie's as an offering to him. And, um, and it felt like the same spirit of the work that I do, but it felt like something he would digest much easier. And so anyway, I just mentioned the word father. And um, I wanted to just say, like, even I deviate, you know, I think, it, I think the thing about art is constantly reinventing um, and keeping, keeping the channel open for where the spirit moves you. And you mentioned the word leadership, and it's, just, it's important to look at the word. You mentioned me being an etymology nerd. And so the word lead, to lead, actually has the word, you know, it, it's, it's really referring in some ways to what moves through a conduit or a conduct. It's like the energy that moves through us into the world. That's why I kept on referring to this gift before. And I'm thinking about, um, if you know Martha Graham, she's got an amazing quote that's, that I don't know off the top of my head, but it essentially starts with the, with the phrase, keep the channel open. Keep the channel open. And so when we talk about leadership, we have to talk about what are we a conduit for? What is moving through us into the world? And how do we model keeping that channel open? And at least from my perspective, so much of the, the hard labor that I do to keep my channel open is, is by practicing a, a, a certain kind of skillful grieving, sometimes publicly, to keep my heart broken in the presence of anyone that gathers around me and thinks that I have something important to say. It's like to keep my heart broken and, to keep, and therefore to keep the channel open and, and to make beauty with what moves through that channel into the world. And so leadership to me is not so much a posturing with strength or, or confidence or even like that I know what's happening. It's really a, a, it's a certain kind of willingness to break my heart and to receive what spirit is offering me. And, um, and sometimes I do that skillfully, sometimes not so skillfully, but it's a faithfulness to that, to keeping the channel open. And, and also to learning what blocks the channel, to learning what, to the crud and the, and the blockages that get in the way of anything moving through me into the world or through you into the world and learning how to, to clear that space. You know, 
in Judaism, we have a lot of, a lot of beautiful rituals that help to clear us, that help to keep that channel moving and, and open. And Yom Kippur to me felt very much like that. You know, mikvah feels very much like that, just to continue to purify ourselves so we can keep an open heart and, and the, the spirit moving through us into the world. So anyway, when you mentioned leadership, that's, that's an important piece I wanted to, to name. Thank you so much, because what's coming up for me, and I, I just pulled up this, I'm going to pull up this slide and show you this for a second, um, because it, this is the, the pathways that Reimagine has been focused on toward growth. Um, and I'll, I'll share them briefly. Uh, this is, this is really comes from the framework of post-traumatic growth and the science and phenomenon around what we can do in our lives to move from, um, to integrate our pain into our, our our life in ways that might help us flourish and it's interesting and i'm just going to read these very briefly briefly first is learning that growth out of adversity is possible the second is building emotional regulation and mindfulness the third is being able to share your story of whatever your experience has been in a safe community uh the fourth is now that you've maybe shared or or these don't have to even be in order but being able to chart a new pathway for yourself not to necessarily try to move back to a baseline but to create new goals new new dreams for yourself or uh or even pursue your dreams after something hard has has transpired in your life and finally doing acts of service um often in the area of your trauma or your pain um so if your dog has has died if you're doing something to honor your dog day that that might be a way to to achieve and to uh, experience this growth but other positive new actions and creativity which can be an act of service for others so so here's some steps but what what's striking me about these and reimagine we're hard at work at building a platform really to help us and anyone connect to each other around these ideas because we believe they build this virtuous cycle and what's so powerful to me is as you, I'm, going to, I'm going to stop my share, but as you're talking about, as Amachai was talking about vulnerability and, and Day was talking about our pain, and I think about the leadership in the world and uh, projections, and here we are three um, male folks here on the stage, and there's conversations about what is masculinity and, and the idea of, of vulnerability um, and, and brokenness um, as being part of of leadership and just just thinking about this growth that and and how you are modeling um vulnerability and authenticity and there's something about having to turn toward the pain and toward uh the the loss and toward the grief that feels like then something that's essential with what um how what it means to lead where it takes me uh brad and i'm i i'm so interested by this chart that you that you shared with us and i'm i'm still i'm like applying it now to so many processes in my own life both my very personal work but also the the, the ritual calendar as i saw some folks i think john mentioned in the chat uh, on the jewish calendar that on some deep rooted ancient and pagan human indigenous wisdom is so connected to both the seasons and human growth um and as they mentioned we just moved out of the day of atonement which is when you think about your death and you think about death and you think about what traumas you inherited as an individual and as a part of a collective and the day of atonement is a way to say okay here we are we're dealing with what we got here we are on this stage on the on the journey and um, and it isn't about um, and it isn't about. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a rabbi. I'm on stage. I'm helping to lead the ceremony. Naomi's with me. She was with me. But every single person in the ritual space is there to do our own work, of processing, of atoning, of thinking, of planning. And then on the Jewish uh, ritual cycle, a few days after Yom Kippur is the full moon, which is the holiday the harvest, which is where we are now, the holiday of Sukkot, um, the holiday of impermanence. And there's a way in which if you take the time each year to consider your mortality, 
the preciousness of time, how sacred every day is, and how you want to live each day with this intention, then comes this week-long holiday of impermanence while you're focusing on art, on hospitality, on nature, on beauty. Um, there are ancient rituals during this holiday that have to do with the anxiety of winter starting and will there be enough rain? Will our crops make it? Will we make it through another winter? So this time of the fall is this time of anxiety that leads to these rituals of joy where we go through trauma we think about mortality we decide to come together and we create these rituals of hope and of uh support like holding each other literally holding each other together hosting each other in our in each other's huts um so that this, and and there's there's like a right now that very few of us know and we're now retrieving of how every year we go through the spiral and it is about grief and it is about growth every year every year we come back to it the little photo and i'm sure we need to end in a moment the photo that i i just sent andy uh, that you all might see in the in the chat just just for laughs i was thinking about you day and putting little debbies for your father's altar humor in ritual space is critical um, this morning, uh, where I am in Maine with a few Jewish mystics, we looked for a place to do our morning ritual of shaking the lulav of the four species and um, and praying for rain, like turning to all six directions. The only spot we could find was the edge of a cemetery. Uh, so respectfully at the edge of a cemetery, we walked around in circles and, and shook our lulav and four species for rain. And I found the spot between a stone that said, Father, and a stone that said mother. That for me very much, my mother is alive. She just turned 93. My father passed away. But this is also the patriarchal, matriarchal, masculine, feminine. Like my spot for standing and honoring the transition and bringing in the winter and all six directions with prayer for, for well-being was in between those two. And it was like, <laughs> I, I was sort of half kidding, but then as I was doing it, I was like, whoa, this is pretty deep. So, <laughs> and my friend really like <laughs> captured the photo. So just to say that when we create ritual space in all the ways we've inherited and reinventing, uh, we are, we're giving the opportunity to touch our deepest grief and our deepest traumas individually and collectively, and with joy, with humor, with respect, with ingenuity, create them in a way that make new opportunity possible for spirit, for presence, for spirit. Um, and that's the gift of rituals in so many ways. Love it. I mean, um, not too far. You're in Maine right now, Amichai? I think, I think I'm on the, I'm on the border between New Hampshire and Maine. So I was there actually, uh, uh, not too long ago and I was in Massachusetts actually. And, um, seeing that photo is, is sparking a memory I have of, um, being on the phone with my grandmother. I was in Northampton, Massachusetts and, and, uh, she said, what are you doing here there? And I said, um, no, I'm just visiting a friend. I've never been here before. And she said, I used to go there all the time as a child. I said, you did? And she said, yeah, my grandparents lived there and they're actually buried there. And, um, and I said, oh, I just so happened to be having dinner with mm -hmm. the only rabbi of Northampton, Massachusetts that night. And so I spoke to him and, um, and he said, oh yeah, there's, we, we tend the oldest cemetery here. You know, it's, it's down the road, make a right, make a left, etc." And the next morning with my oldest friend, we went to the cemetery and, um, and we found my great, great grandparents' graves and, um, which was remarkable in itself and all of their family buried there. And, um, and then we went through the, 
the practice that I do, which is, you know, wandering about the place and connecting with the land itself and bringing pieces together and making an offering to remember and, and letting that offering be impermanent. And, um, and so it was beautiful to, to, and then of course we put stones on their grave too, but, but really the act of, of remembering, creating a, um, a new ritual to remember my dead was, um, was really moving to me and to know that I had the bones in the ground there was just really remarkable. Um, but, you know, to, to piggyback off of what you said, Amicha, you know, when I do my, my art, I mean, it really goes through those seasons that you were remembering just now. And, you know, it starts kind of in the East, it starts in spring. Um, you know, when I practice my, this art form, this practice, morning altars, I start in a place of wonder. Um, and I go out and I explore and I, I, I really just take in the place itself and, and just, you know, I'm awestruck by, by bark and berries and leaves. And, and then I'm, the practice itself moves into a place of, of creativity or, or summertime or the South. It moves into the the practice of creation and exploration of of trying things out, which is also if you if you track this cycle, it also you could fit human developmental tracks in the cycle too, which is baby adolescence, and then my own practice moves into the West, which is autumn and meaning and gratitude and in some ways collecting some semblance of remembering. Um, which is really the place of adulthood and grief, recognizing the limitations of things. And then my practice, the next step is the, is the north or, or the elder and wintertime and impermanence, the scattering of things, the scattering of the, of the altar, the scattering of the seeds, the scattering of the prayers. But the beautiful thing about the practice itself is it doesn't end there. It crosses again into the East. And so when I do this work, I really, really try and communicate that it's not a one and done thing, that it, it's continuously moving. Impermanence leads to creation. Impermanence leads to creation. Letting something go and change leads to new creation. And so, you know, when we forget, it's an opportunity to remember. When we lose something, it's an opportunity to find something. And when something go, gets destroyed it's an opportunity to make it again and so to me the act of of the art and that I'm, i continuously am learning from my own practice is that the name of the game is the againness it's the continued act of making something from the old pieces and recreating them reimagining them regenerating them into something new and that's where the the holiness lies it's in the recreation of the old into the new again. Wow. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you both so much for, for this conversation. I know Am Amachai has to take off in, in a second. Um, and I really want to uh, have Naomi join us for the ritual aspect. I'm wondering, I've never done this before, but in two minutes, I'm wondering if in these two minutes I can just rapid fire. You're going to, I'm, I'm offering like one sentence definitions from each of you on, on like two questions and just in no more than one sentence. Okay. What is spirituality? I'm a high. The cultivation of the quality of being present. Day, what is creativity? Creativity is the, um, the reception and remembrance of where we've come from and what we're here to do. And maybe both of you, what is, what is love? I, I'll jump in to love is the remembrance that what is here right now is not meant to last. And yet, it's still here. And what is gone could be remembered in love. And so there's 
Oh, I'm supposed to rapid fire. Sorry, but <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful day. It's so yeah. beautiful. Love it what is, and it is an invitation. I think <laughs> that honestly, even the I think is 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 perfect at the end. It's like, you know, that's that's the humility and authenticity that comes into something profound, and what makes I think is the essence of what when we talk about spiritual leadership. Just that comma, I think, at the end, uh, and that curiosity, I think, is is something that you both hold so dear in your wonder and curiosity about the world and how you're bringing that into your words and into your hearts and into the lives of so many people that you're touching through your 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 own expression and your own brokenness and your own journey. Um, so thank you so much, both of you, for being here in this space and for those incredible answers. Amichai, I love you and I miss you. And I, I plead to the gods of travel that our roads might cross again and we might just embrace and ha share a glass of wine and just share the, the journeys that we've been on. And same with you, Brad. May our roads, it's been too long. So whoever might be listening, may those roads let our paths cross again. All right, so we'll let yeah. Amachai take off, and we're going to then Brent, bring... Um, thank you. Thank you, Amachai. We're going to let... Uh, I'm sorry I can't you. stay. Thank oh. you so much. Everyone, let's share deep gratitude to Amachai, which we can send to him. If you're able to go into the chat, we can share that in the chat and pass that along for his, his uh, incredible presence. And now I would love to turn it over to Naomi, uh, who we heard about at the beginning, and this is going to lead us through this powerful opportunity to honor our loved ones today. Now, Naomi, before we enter names in the chat, um, which th during your, your your musical section that you're gonna lead us through, do you wanna share something verbally or are we gonna get right into the music? I wanna set people up for their, for this moment I'm here. I'm gonna, yeah, first of all, I just like wanna <laughs> just take a moment to pause for Oz of that conversation um that was i i my my heart and my mind and my spirit are all just sort of exploding right now so um thank you for for those profound questions that you set up brad and day you know amichai i have the pleasure of talking to you basically every day and i'll tell him tomorrow but day um just deep deep wisdom and really grateful i'm very inspired um brad so what i'll say is that um i want to share <clears throat> just set up kind of how we're going to do this um offering of bringing our loved ones into the space through the context of this exact particular present moment right now on the on the calendar of the the jewish calendar the lunar calendar um, and then this moment of harvest and and those of you some of you know I know I see John's holding up his beloved Robin on there some of you are part of our Kaddish club and so you've probably heard me say this before but um, I the times right now currently is one of the four times during the year that um, the yeast core service or ritual is created it's in the pilgrimage holidays of the jewish calendar um yom kippur is the big one that a lot of people know um, but also the three holidays that folks traveled from all over to come to jerusalem the big kahuna you know so to speak and make harvest offerings um, it was pagan it was agrarian it was jewish it was ritual who knows it was a really big party we do know that and so you can imagine that people living all over the place, all over the world, all over different countries coming into Jerusalem to make these offerings, to offer their first fruits or their first harvest. They haven't seen a lot of these people since the last big holiday where they came and made pilgrimage. And so you have to think to yourself, what are they talking about? Oh, you know, so-and-so had a baby and so-and-so, you know, got great crops this year. And also so-and-so lost somebody in their life. That is most likely how I imagine, I think, these memorial programs emerged because it became necessity. People were gathering and that's where they would share that they lost someone. 
So on these days of memory where we're offering first fruits, in the holiday of Sukkot, this moment of time that we're in right now, where there is such a gathering and a harvesting, there's also this really beautiful invitation if you sit in these temporary imper impermanent shelters to invite in the ancestors. And there's a lot of traditional ways to invite in ancestors, biblical ancestors, etc. But also it's been expanded modernly to invite in your ancestors into this hut, this sukkah, this shelter of peace. So what I'd like to do, if it's okay, Brad, is to share a, just a, a one line chant, which says spread over us a, a, a sukkah, a shelter of peace. And to share that as folks are writing in the names of those of, that you're bringing into our shelter tonight. This sukkah, these walls that we've put up temporarily on Zoom. But maybe we can even see the stars peeking above. I'm a big Lion King fan. Stars make a lot of, you know, pictures in my mind of Mufasa and other ancestors that are there. So as I share this, um, will you please do enter into the chat the name of those who you are remembering tonight and anything in anything you want to share about them in the chat and we'll we'll be present to it together to hold that space. Knowing that we're humanifesting memories even just by voicing their names. Ufro Sadeinu Sukkot Sukkot Shalom or do you want me to do it as I'm playing? I can do it. Okay, go for it. Mick and Crow from Jennifer. Zubin, my friend Brian Christian. From Nicole, my dad, Tan Kyan T. I miss you, Papa. Patrice Eggleston, Julia Neary, from Anne Marie Decker, my sisters Agnes and Therese, my husband Daryl, my parents John and Jacob, from Steinfelds, Nancy Grimes Steinfeld, from Rhonda, Mary Rose, from Donna, for my Nana, Helen Campbell, from Cher, my dad Arnold, from Janet, my fabulous mom, Priscilla. From Jay, Julius Leave. Why, Julius? Tell me. From Patrice, David Lewis Eggleston, his father. From Kayleen Dowell, Art and Roxy Dowell, my parents. Byron Dowell, my nephew. Becky Smith, my friend. From Day Chin, Bob Evans, my beloved partner in all things in life. My mom and dad, Fran and Don Clegg. From Cassandra Adams, all six of my grandchildren, Donato and Matilda, Ruth and Edward Stanley, and Ruth and Harold. From Vicki, beloved Dale Kirk Mack. From Brandy, Cheryl and Eugene, Matthew, Ruth, Thomas, Clara, and Pap. From Eden, Fagi Baskana Rochel, William Dovid, Ben Bessie, the Melvin. From Michelle, my mother, Rena, my beloved sister, Wendy, my ancestors, Zelda, Sally, Lewis. From Patrice, Vivian, Betty, Marie, Matson, Eggleston. From Kathy, Francis, Lacey, Jenkins, my warrior mom. From Nancy, my mother, Barbara, and father, Leo. From Andrea, 
Istvan Puk and Clara Puk together again over the rainbow. You are loved and you are missed. From Patrice, Douglas Lance Eggleston, from Jay, Louis Amandello, from Naomi, Bob and Madeline Less, her unconditionally loving, supportive, fallible, and imperfectly perfect parents. From Eden, beautiful grandmothers Rose and Bessie, from Stephanie, my brother Tim, who died suddenly in August, from Day, my old friend Diane Pamelson, Paul Palmerson, my father Michael Schildkret, my aunt Miriam Jacobson, and grandmother Thelma Jack Jacobson, grandfather Ben Schildkret, and Daniel Jacobson. And forgive me if I've missed any others. Thank you, Naomi, and thank you, Day, for those beautiful uh, altars that we've been looking at that you've made and, and, and that blessing, Naomi, and that invitation, and all of you uh, for those, those, those shares, those names, those, those words. Let's just all take one breath together, one collective breath to honor that entire um, list of names that Andy, you so, you so um, wonderfully read. And if we didn't read your name, that you've been sharing it's know that the names are still in our heart so let's on the count of three just take a, a deep breath together three two one how about one more Thank you all for holding such sweetness in, in your hearts through this section of the vigil. It was very, very special and very, um, very nice. And, and I just want to share these, uh, a couple other of these altars that, that Day was, uh, has photographed of his, of his work and the beautiful uh, symmetry and asymmetry of of art and creativity and love and ritual as we move on to the extinguishing prayer and not one of them exist anymore thank you day for those works and those offerings for all of us and now I want to invite Naomi and Day and, 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 and all of you, um, if you so choose, to, if you have a candle, to extinguish the candle with us as we, uh, upon reading this, this, this following prayer, we'll, we'll do it together. If you want to keep your candles lit, there are many traditions where that is the best way uh, to let them, let them um, flame out naturally. Uh, so with that, Naomi, I'll turn it over to you and then Day, then I'll, I'll read. And if wherever you each are, if you want to share these words um, about what we've all done as a collective, we can share them out loud wherever we are. By extinguishing our candles, we release light into our world to keep alive the memories of those we honor today and tomorrow and for the rest of our lives. By extinguishing our candles, we release light into our world to keep alive the memories of those we honor today and tomorrow and for the rest of our lives. By extinguishing our candles, we release light into our world 
to keep alive the memories of those we honor today and tomorrow and for the rest of our lives. On the count of three, if you so choose, uh, or if you just want to take a breath with us, we will extinguish our candles as a community. Three, two, one. And Naomi, if you don't mind keeping that music going a little bit in the background as we do some thank yous, and then I'll invite you, if you wouldn't mind also, with one final song at the end of some of the uh, of our gratitude and some of our upcoming events. But this music in the background, just this gorgeous strumming. Is it coming through? Well, in, a in a beautiful way, in a beautiful way. Don't don't stop. I, I, we invite the, the strumming to continue. It's, it's holding a very beautiful space for us. Thank you. And just before um, we hear uh, a final song to, to, to close out the evening from Naomi, I just want to share again special thanks to Day, Amakai, and Naomi. I drafted a little poem as I was listening to your words tonight. In between, you can only draft the poem when poems are so short uh, in, on the fly, but this is what I, I drafted. These are called 15s, five syllables, or five lines, three syllables each. But for you two who are still here with us, ritual, how do you, how you do? What words knew they could not, something more. And then to reimagine staff um, who has made this event possible, uh, thank you so much. Andy, Nicole, Zubin, Dara, Margaret, Chris, uh, everyone who's who's been a part of this experience tonight, thank you so much uh, for making it possible. And then to all of you who have shown up with us um, in this space to make it a space that we're all co-creating together every month, sad but glad, to mourn, grieve, grow in love together. Okay, as are you still there? Because I, I really want Naomi song to be the last thing we hear, I feel, but I just want to give you over these chords any last, any last, uh, you know, pearl for us. Uh, but thank you so much for for being with us. I'll I'll just say as I transfer hats, <clears throat> these were the last words that my father said before he died, and my brother made a hat. Well, he sells these, but he he made a hat of my father's words, and really that's his art. And so I wear this to remember him and and also to remember the walk in the world, to have courage and to keep the faith as we do this work. And as Nate, thank you, Day, thank you. And I have to run and I love you, thank you. Okay, thank you. And to, to share gratitude with Day and Naomi and the whole crew here, if you wanna just chat it out uh, while Naomi takes us out with this final song, uh, that would be that would be beautiful. Naomi, do you wanna set this up for us so we can? Yeah, and it's so perfect by what everyone was saying about the art and the transformation and offering and what are the gifts. Um, when my mom passed away March 17th, 2016, I have a dear friend who's in Toronto, Aviva Chernik, and she is a songstress and a spiritual leader and incredible meditation teacher. And it was, it was, uh, I was bereft and she unbeknownst to me she sent me a voice memo in a text sitting down at her piano she said this just this just came out and it's for you and they were the words that are traditionally said when you meet a, a person in the jewish faith who is a mourner may you be comforted amongst the mourners of zion and uh and jerusalem and she wrote this and sent it to me. And that is the healing power of art. So this has become something that we have used. We now use it in our memorial service and uh, at Lab Shul. And those that are here from Cottage Club will recognize this because we use this as well. So, you know, we share our gifts to help healing and transformation get catalyzed. You never know who it's going to help. May you 
find comfort. May you find comfort. May you find comfort in love. May you. Find comfort. May you find comfort in love. Hamakol May you find comfort in love. Thank you all. We Thanks for being here. We'll see you again in the next few days, hopefully, especially at the, the Circle of Celebration event. And Naomi, thank you for, for, for treating us to your gifts and to all of you for your gifts of, of your presence this evening. And I look forward to all of us being able to share our gifts in other ways with each other as we continue on in this journey of life.